Okay, so um, so talk about supporting things you create, and uh, in reference to Drupal, um, who here is interested in supporting Drupal in terms of supporting clients and their Drupal sites? Okay, and who here is interested in supporting Drupal in terms of contributing back to the community? So it's the same thing. All right, I'm gonna to try to touch on both of those things. Uh, first, my name is Kelly Albrecht. Um, I'm the founder of Last Call Media. Uh, we do a lot of support work, uh, mostly there. I'm a agile scrum master and a product owner for different projects. And um, really, we, I call my role a producer. So I'm more in the, more in the product owner side of things, producing uh, websites for clients. Um, so Last Call does a lot of support work um, where we are a full service agency so we do create a lot of new things, we do a lot of new builds but we also try to stick around to support things and we say that we're Last Call because the sales pitch is we're the last call you need to make. So we're there till the end. We do the support work, so it's part of our branding that we stick around and support the project after all the excited, exciting creative building has completed. Uh, we do that by trying to adhere to an agile methodology of inspecting and adapting to clients' needs, their projects, and what, what other technical needs they may have. Um, so we do that, um, and we do that with a lot of Drupal, right? So even right from the beginning when we started, we, I was really into Drupal a long time ago, and I wanted more Drupal work, and uh, I built a team of people like me, and uh, we were contributing back to Drupal, and we were, you know, and clients were finding us and bringing their problems to us, and we wanted that work. It was fun to solve problems with Drupal. We knew what we were doing and it felt good to be making a living. And we wanted our clients to know us and trust us. We wanted them to know how much we cared about them and their needs. We wanted them to want us to help them. So as a community of trusted experts, as, as part of that community, we've, uh, we've solved, and as a community, we've solved a lot of problems and we've created a lot of Drupal in the process. So like most things, if you create it, you support it, right? If you created a family, now you have to support it. If you created a business, now you have to support it. If you created some solution for something, you have to support it. So we created some Drupal. Now we have to support it, right? That's the top of the talk today. We sold Drupal to the world. Now we must support it. So, creation is different than support, right? Creation is fun. And support is hard. Creation can be hard too. But there's some like overriding funness that comes with creation. So, support uh, is consuming while creation is exciting. There's some, there's some differences. Support is about sustainability. A lot of times creation is, is different than that. Creation is, it, it's not so much a concern when you're creating things whether or not it'll be sustainable. Uh, support is putting shoes on your kids. Support takes emotional labor. Support is hard. Support is that hard, Monday, mundane, day in and day out kind of work that needs to get done every day or things start falling apart. So, since that last call, we do a lot of support work, and we're struggling a lot of times, wh whether things are slipping through the cracks, or whether people are excited about that image swap that they just did, and now they have to do it again because someone changed their mind, or, or whatever little thing it might be. It's on my mind, trying to understand what, what is support work and how can we do it better. And so, I've been thinking about it, and I noticed something 
uh, just around my house. Um, so in my house, I've got I've got some children. I've got some creations of my own that that I need to support. And or in in my house, if my kids make like a sandwich or something, and they and they finish the bag of bread. They, they, they finish all the bread. Um, lucky if they throw the bag away, and they usually do, but something that doesn't seem to make it into the trash is this little bread tie. It somehow finds its home on the countertop. Has anybody seen this happen in, in and around your home? There's just this bread tie, and you might even pass it. You might, you might be on your way to do something much more important, and you notice it there. I know that something that used to go through my head is, well, I don't want to throw that away. Somebody might be saving that for later. They might have put it there, and I don't want to throw their bread tie out. They might be planning on using that later, right? And so I'm be I, I've gotten better at that, but I'll admit that a few years ago in my home, that bread tie would sit on the counter until my wife threw it away. I'm ashamed to admit, it almost seemed like it was my wife's job to throw away all the bread ties. And that's, that's not cool, right? So it's those little things that, that equal support, good support, right? Paying attention to the little things, all right? So I started thinking, what, what are, I started noticing bread ties everywhere, not, not the, not the bread tie like you see in the picture, but just analogies to this bread tie. What are the little things? And I brought this thinking with me into the office. And, I've been, and one day I went into the office and I, for some reason I really wanted a cup of coffee. And I went, we have a coffee machine. It makes one cup at a time. And you just press a button and it grinds the beans and it, and it drips the coffee in your cup. And I really, really wanted one of those. And I came, got up to the coffee machine and there was a coffee cup blocking my path, just sitting there empty. Okay, so I moved that out of the way. And I put my coffee cup in the way and I pushed the button to, to start it. And it didn't start. And I, what I realized was there were these blinking error lights. So the person that came before me hit these arrow lights and they just ran. So I thought, the coffee machine's broken. This is one of those bread ties. I should just, I, I should figure out why, this, why these arrow lights are, are blinking. I should provide a little support to coffee in my office. And so with my new thinking about, about little bread ties not being picked up by anyone, and the weight of the, of the cleanliness of, and of someone's environment being pushed to the one person who cares, with that thinking in mind, I decided that I would figure out these error lights. And so I looked through the drawers below it and I found the manual and I went to the page in the manual that told me what these error lights were all about and it told me that the coffee maker needed to be descaled. Does anybody know what descaling is? Yeah. So, so you might know how annoying it is. Running a bunch of vinegar first. Yeah. yeah. So, so it needed to be descaled. So I thought to myself, I think I might have seen the scaler. And so instead of like yelling across the room, hey, does anybody know where the descaler is? I kept looking and I found some decalcifier. And I, instead of yelling, hey, does anybody know, <coughs> you know if the calcifier is the same thing as the scaler? I Googled it. And it is. Decalcifier is the same thing as descaler. And I followed steps. I followed, you know, I got to step eight in the, in the manual. And um, where then I got to step nine and it said, I, please repeat steps two through eight until you've used up all your de decalcif, all your descaler. This may take an hour and a half. Ah, I have a meeting. So, I abandoned that situation. I, I, uh, I, I messaged in the Slack channel that, hey, I got to step eight. If somebody can 
finish the starting on step nine, that would be great. So I felt like that was a pretty good compromise. But this got me thinking about the difference between accountability and responsibility. So in a family, uh, or basically where people are free, volunteering for free, you can't have accountability. You get what you get is people taking responsibility to do things. So uh, I'll define the difference as, uh, the difference between accountability and responsibility, like so. Um, accountability is when you're the one who is committed to accounting for the completion of something or for the, the, the state of something. So you may not be the one that ends up taking responsibility for doing that thing, but you're the one that's, that sees to it that it gets done, even if that means you have to do it. Responsibility is you can take responsibility for something that you do. So there's, so there's a difference there. So in, um, in, in the workplace, we can have someone accountable to doing something, and they may have a team where anyone on that team can do that thing and take responsibility for doing it. But the accountable person has to make sure it gets done you know, by the end of the day or whenever they're, they've committed to being accountable to it. So in a family scenario, it's a shared responsibility in the family to, or it should be a shared responsibility to help keep the house tidy, maybe you know, fold your laundry, help out with the dishes, these are all shared responsibilities. You can, you can try to, to teach your children about taking more responsibility and maybe even making themselves accountable to something, but they're kids, and at some point they're gonna move out. But in business, you're paying people. You can pay people to be accountable to a thing. So with this coffee maker, we could make coffee maker support, coffee maker maintenance, we could make someone in the company accountable to that so that when those error lights are blinking, we can say, hey, you're the one who has committed to keeping this thing maintained. You need to do this. Um, whereas, say, in contributing to, to Drupal, it's all volunteer work, or for the most part. So it's, a, it's more of a shared responsibility, and in open source in general. It's a, it's a shared responsibility to, to have your eyes on the code and fix things as you see them. Um, so when supporting Drupal for clients as a business, um, we have some experience with that. Some, I can tell some stories about that from last call's perspective. Um, so. We have a lot of support work uh, because that's just where we started out trying to help. You know, we weren't we we didn't have a lot of big name big name clients at first, so we tried to fit in where we could, and that equaled getting started by doing support. Um, and now it's now it's part of our part of our brand name, so we have to keep we want to keep doing it. Um, we had a great sell. We, did, we were able to say support is in our roots. We have an awesome support infrastructure. We had this other thing that we would say. We would say we, we only book out people 70% of their time. So when we have a new build or new work to do, we're only putting people on that new work 70% of the time. And that leaves them free 30% of the time for any support work that might pop up. Does anybody do, do this kind of scheduling of, of people? No? Okay, well, well we learned that, that it doesn't work. But we used, to, we, used to do, we used to do a partial split between new work and support work. And there were, there, were, there, were, there were issues were emerging from that because this made people not like support work. They didn't have the same energy for it. They didn't want to go the extra mile dealing, they didn't want to deal with the loose ends picking up the bread ties, so to speak. 
the the seventy percent of their time was exciting, creating a new build or something, and then the thirty percent of their time was getting filled up with interruptions, and this was this was causing a little a little bit of burnout. There was too much creation, not enough support. Support work was an interruption, um, and this this came to a head in a big way because one of our business development strategies was to do excellent support work, doing the little, doing the little tasks and for, for our clients because at some point they would want to do something like maybe redoing their whole entire website. And that would be a, a, a larger, much more exciting project. And this came to a head when people, we were just basically doing worse and worse and worse support work over time because of this, I think because of this 70-30 split and people just hated support work it was just a big interruption and we were just doing a bad job at it and so one of our clients who, who have a great relationship raised a flag very early on saying you know the support work just hasn't really been going that great we're concerned that you're not going to be able to do this huge project that we have coming up very soon so the so our whole strategy was a was about to backfire um, we were able to, to work it out with the client, but what we had to do internally was basically rebrand support internally. So we had, to, we had to change it so that people could stop hating support and that the people that were accountable to support could focus on that. And that was really what we did. We took, when it was the 70-30 scheduling, it really had support work in our company in one of those shared <laughs> responsibility situations where Nobody was accountable. It was just everybody and everybody's 30% of their time, they just had to help out with some of the support work. And that was hard. That was very hard. But since we're a business, we were able to identify people that we wanted to make accountable to the support work as it came in. And they were able to focus on support and focus on things that, that are interesting about support problems and do a good job and not be interrupted by, by other work and not have the support work be an interruption to something that they um, were working on. Um, it made support, we, in this rebrand internally, we made support work matter. We had to identify what's important about support, where, where support is important. It's about sustainability. It's about doing those very, very important small things, sometimes small things. So, open source though, on the other hand, is by definition a shared responsibility. Nobody owns it. You are free to partake in it. The code is shared and so is the responsibility. If you prefer open source or I should say free software, you also possibly unknowingly prefer shared responsibility. Free software is inherently inclusive and collaborative. The vast majority of participation is driven by intrinsic motives for personal growth. Relationships and helping others um, also is an endeavor that creates actual happiness, dedication, and community. And I think that as a community, this is our best work. The work isn't just for a letter grade or a paycheck. There's something that is really rewarding about supporting something together with people to share in that responsibility. Um, this is the business of caring, of consideration, uh, of sharing. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So this is the business of being an active set of eyeballs in a shared vision. So there's, there's, something, there's something about it that we all want to do. And we, we all make it happen together. And I think recognizing that is an important thing to do when thinking about contributing back to Drupal. Um, and really, it's what's behind the come for the code, stay for the community, right? It's that community of shared responsibility. So, what are some of the bread ties in supporting Drupal? It can be overwhelming. 
right? Trying to figure out how to support Drupal. But if if support is those those small but very important things that are often overlooked, it it could be good to identify some of those, and that could that could help it be less overwhelming to figure out how to support Drupal, right? So it doesn't have to be. You don't have to write a whole new, you know, initiative, uh, complete a whole initiative and core to be supporting Drupal. You don't have to contribute a whole new module to be uh, supporting Drupal. There are a lot of really important things in Drupal that are similar to just throwing out that bread tie that nobody seems to want to touch. Um, anybody here think of some, some bread ties in, in supporting Drupal? What do you mean by bread tie? Well, I told this story, um, I think before you got in, about how um, when my kids make a sandwich and they use all the bread. They might throw the bag away, but the bread tie just like finds its home on the counter and just sits there. Nobody wants to pick it up, it just stays. Or even like a random piece of laundry. Somebody doesn't want to bring it up to the laundry room or whatever. So it's these easy these easy tasks that that it's it's easy for, for people to feel like what they need that what they need to be doing is more important or what they what other things they're doing are more important. Yeah, I get it. So what's the question? So what can, in supporting Drupal, I'm wondering if anybody here can think of any, any of those types of situations if you're thinking about supporting, uh, contributing back to the Drupal project, right? So um, adding tests to an issue to help it get through, I think, is an example. So there are a lot of uh, patches being contributed back in the issue queue. Um, testing patches is an example. You could look through the issue queue and find uh, patches to test. Um, any minor code style cleanup and commenting as you see it is, is another one. Yep. It would just be reporting issues. Reporting issues. Yep. Yeah, just getting in there and helping with kind of the, the organization of the issue queue. You know, sometimes things are duplicated. Sometimes... Uh, Things are not really an issue and are solved somewhere else. But well, we've even seen a number of times where we're like, hey, this module is really cool. Or like in theory, it does exactly what we need. We go to use it, and something's broken. We go, oh, it's broken. That sucks. We move on to find something else instead of just telling the developer or reporting, hey, this happens when you yep. the module this way. Yep. Right. Right. So the really um, yeah, right, like keeping notes on tickets clear and updated. Is it kind of touches on that one. Documentation outside of code on on D.O. Um, especially since Drupal 8 has been released, there's a need for keeping the docs up to date. That's a not a super challenging thing that that would really help. Um, anything to make the next developer's life easier. Uh, there's this idea of code gardeners, right? Like tending to your garden, keeping it nice and and uh, and tended to. Um, and really a lot of this, all this stuff really helps prevent burnout. Like if you are a maintainer of something and you're holding yourself accountable to this big complicated thing and there's all these bread ties building up and nobody's helping with these smaller things, that leads to burnout because you can't do everything, right? So, we like to say this in, in, in our community, in the free software, open source community in general, that everybody has a responsibility to, to help out and, and make this work. We just say this. But how are we doing on accountability? So it's kind of hard to hold people accountable that you aren't paying. But one example that I would like to bring up is that um, it's kind of interesting to see the Drupal Marketplace kind of make attempts at what I would consider um, creating accountability in, in supporting Drupal. So they keep making changes. Uh, some of the most recent changes I think are great, where it where they're doing they're working on doing more and more. And, and, and Megan mentioned this a little bit uh, in, in her talk earlier today. 
to credit companies that are contributing back. And it used to be just with code commits. Well, not it used to be alphabetical. Then it was code commits. And now if you write case studies, if you do more of these, these bread tie type things, like, uh, like writing a case study about Drupal 8, that will boost your ranking in the Drupal marketplace so that when people hit the marketplace off the main page to see who might I hire, they're gonna get to the first page, they might get to the second page, by the third page, they're probably done. So you wanna get up, to, up into those pages. So that is, that is a, uh, those are changes that are focused on incentivizing agencies to take more responsibility and to do it regularly. And when you do that regularly, that's probably about as close as you can get to getting people to hold themselves accountable to contributing back to Drupal. Um, and I would say, I've been, I've been keeping track of this for a while, and, and it works. I know that my company, we, have, we hold ourselves accountable to contributing enough to keep ourselves on the, on the first page. So it's not, it's not easy, you have to, and we're actually slipping. I think we're down toward the bottom of the first page, so we're gonna have to shuffle some, some resources a little bit. Um, but it's worked. We're holding, we're holding ourselves accountable. We want to stay on that first page. We're looking for ways to contribute back to Drupal. And I've also seen where if you want to get your commits up, if you want to get your contributions up, there's a lot of really easy kills. What I've been referring to as bread ties could also be considered easy kills. A lot of those, a lot of those testing patches, a lot of those updating documentation, a lot of that stuff will add up in, in the Drupal marketplace to pushing you up in your ranking. Um, so so that's, that's been a really good thing, I think, for bringing, encouraging accountability in an otherwise shared responsibility um, ecosystem. So our support team, which during our rebrand, we, instead of calling them support, we actually took support out of the whole company and we called it SLA, Service Level Agreement which sounded much, much tougher. Um, so they're the SLA team, service level agreement team. And they've been, they've been giving back, contributing back a lot more um, because really they're focused, they're focused just on our service level agreements. And when they run out of stuff to do, which happens, you know, because you need to be available and responsive um, and, to, and you need to be ready to, to jump on any support issue that comes in. So when they're being ready to jump on a support issue, during that time, they're contributing back to Drupal to keep our marketplace rank up. And, you know, for other good reasons, because it's just good to support something that, that like Drupal that we all depend on. Um, so they're able to focus on that. So that's great on the broader scale to focus on accountability, I think. But I want to close today by focusing on the smaller scale, the you and me. Understanding the importance of accountability and focus regarding support will help. But we should also proceed accepting the fact that open source is a shared responsibility and that's what's beautiful about it. The easiest way to think about, uh, about them, if we choose to think about them at all, is to think about what they mean to our own deeply personal existence. Like, like the dishes is a shared responsibility. And I could let the dishes pile up, but it, uh, it's important to the person that I share that responsibility with that it gets done a little, that they don't pile up. So we need to think about them in the context of what they mean to those we share them with, or else there's gonna be some burnout. And we don't want burnout because then the whole thing is gridlocked. Um, but if you're like me, you have a large number of shared responsibilities that aren't as big a concern to you. Um, but we need to focus on our shared responsibilities for the sake of what we are supporting, but also for the sake of who we are supporting it with. The Goldsmith's children have no jewels. Baker's children don't eat cake. Cobbler's children have no shoes. How much time does one thing take? Everyone knows the scenario as well, having to prioritize what one creates and supports in a day, often not getting to everything, with some things never being gotten to. 
What is it about the tasks we don't seem to be able to ever get to doing? You may hear this referred to as a cobbler kid situation. To relate this to shared responsibility, if putting shoes on your kids, metaphorically speaking, is a two-person job, you better be putting in 50%, whether you care about shoes or not. Otherwise, you risk burning out those that do care and jeopardizing the bigger picture, which you do care about. So let's be aware, let's be those eyeballs, and let's also seek awareness of what we can do to support, even the small things, even the things that don't seem important, they are. Let's be on the lookout for all the little ways we each might be able to help more. And ask yourself, whose job is this? Right? Like, that's what I started doing when I started thinking about that bread tie. Whose job is it to pick up these bread ties? Or I came across, across that coffee machine, these arrow lights on this coffee machine. Whose job is it to, to get these arrow lights to go away so I can just get my cup of coffee? Um, whose job is it to test these patches? Whose job is it to update this documentation? Right? So that's a good way to, to think about it if you're looking for, for ways to support something in small but meaningful ways. Whose job is it? So asking whose job is this? And if you see a bread tie, pick it up. Thank you. Anybody have any support questions? When, when you guys are doing, performing the support role for your clients, um, did you have to kind of restructure how the dev team works in support? No, I think we were able to do it without clients, without restructure, well, without the client, are you asking if the clients knew about any restructuring? Well, no, if the, if the clients, you know, they're reaching out to you it's to report the problem, like yeah. you say. Um, I guess the 70-30 on your role's end was that the developers were spending 70% of their time on new projects, 30% on support. Yeah. So you had to do that internal restructure for the dev role. What was kind of the solution you ended up with that seemed to work well for you guys? Yeah, so, um, right, so the restructuring was purely just on the way we scheduled developers. Uh, so we still had the account management, project management layer that would field those, uh, those would, uh, triage those support issues because sometimes it's user error, sometimes it's right. solved by documentation that we already gave them or something. Um, so really it would be, after that ticket is reported, it used to just be, hey, who is the person that is the most familiar with you? And it could be any developer. And it would be like, hey, can you help with this? You know you're on this other project, here's a support work that came in with a, on a project that you're most familiar with. And so the way that it changed was uh, we, would, we would have two, we, well, we had three build teams at the time that we, 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 re burnt, we changed the structure. So we had three teams that were doing new build work, and then there was a fourth team, which was the SLA team. So then when that request came in, it would go into, into like the support team's backlog according to service level agreement, it would get prioritized, and the account management layer in the company would monitor to make sure that we responded back according to the service level agreement. But the support team would meet every day to look at that backlog and to get those things done. Okay. So it wouldn't, re so it would be those, those, the people on that team. So even if someone on like team A had the most experience, they wouldn't be responsible for doing the support tasks that just came. They might get consulted, mm -hmm. and they might get you know interrupted a little bit to, to help with that. But that was how we restructured. So clients still submitted issues the same way. Okay. Did you make the assignments, or did was it a volunteer thing? That was, that's a really good question. Yeah. So that was delicate because we because <laughs> we were coming from a a. Uh, the culture in the company had developed such that people didn't like support. Um, so yeah, right. So one of the one of the big things that helped that was um, the CTO was on board uh, with the idea, and he uh, committed to heading up the support team. 
so he was, and every, everybody wants to work with him. They, everybody likes to work with him. He's, he's an excellent mentor. He's, a, he's excellent at what he does. So he was able to identify some people and, and let them know that, that he would really like them on this team. And, he, and it was looked at, uh, and it still is, it is now looked at as a way to get in the trenches of some of the most difficult work and to really like learn quickly. You know, so like if you can do some of the some of the crazy random support tasks that come in, then you should be able to handle uh, a, a new build, which is a lot of times it's stuff that you do all the time. You know, there aren't, there aren't too many surprises. So it's kind of pitched that way. So I think a lot of people, um, some people are kind of like easygoing, like okay, you know, I'll do this, whatever. But um, some of the, uh, at least one of the one of the people that we thought would be excellent for the support team that we were nervous about, we saw it as an opportunity to to level up his skills quickly. Yeah, we um, we had kind of a similar situation with the support on the, the dev side of the house. So we ended up when we ended up kind of heavy on the developer personnel side. Yeah. That we were assigning, we created a role we called the mercenary role, and so when we did our morning scrums. We actually had a whole support board that the mercenary would go through and with the PMs kind of figure out which tickets were most important and assign them. And that mercenary role would be like for the first week or the first. In support, we actually do a three day and a two day sprint just on the support side. Oh, interesting. And so the mercenary was in charge of taking care of the support tickets, but also consulting with the devs that were familiar with those projects. Interesting. The, the same kind of solution. So, yeah, the mercenary. The mercenary is accountable. Yes, the cortex. So he's the person who's responsible for. He's not going to know everything about all these different projects, yep. but he's the one who's going to go find the answers and yep. find the solution. Yeah, yeah. It was really important to bring accountability into it, or else, er, er, for people's sanity. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the average time for resolving a ticket? That's a good question because I know. The last time I looked at our our support boards, um, some stuff gets kicked back to, to clients for whatever reason. And that's actually something that we were talking about just last week. So we we use we use boards for, for ticket where tickets are at. And so there's a two client board. So a lot of times it's sent back to them to for user acceptance. Sometimes it's sometimes the support ticket that comes in is hey, how, what's the level of effort on this thing I want to do? And we kick that level of effort back to them for approval. And that board is just getting unwieldy because it's just loaded with stuff that they're just too busy to deal with. Um, so that makes it tough. I'd say excluding that kind of scenario, same day to, to two days. So, you know, some of the support stuff that comes in is, is kind of like, a small project that they're asking yeah, me on. It's all over the place. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what we do with what we do with that, that that's that's kind of a tricky thing. Um, well, well, how we handle this now is basically the SLA team could at any point in time be the entire company, but as um, as work comes in that is bigger than a small task, then we'll assemble a build team and they'll leave the support team and build that thing. And when that thing is over, they're back on the support team. So if we're, if we're as busy as we ever are, we'll have, we'll have three build teams working on new builds, and the rest of the people are on, on the support team. But right now we have, right now we have two build teams, and kind of a, kind of a bigger support team than, than usual. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.